The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Morning. I think Pastor Ray said the other day, uh, we were having lunch, he said, the beauty of Southside Bible is that the pulpit has been an honorable thing. And I hope I don't break that record today. (laughs) The only thing that we preach is this, the Word of God. That's all I got. If you want something more, you got to go somewhere else. We've been looking at the uh, seven I am's. There's actually a lot more than seven in the book of John. There's many more than that, actually. But we're looking at seven of them, probably the seven of the most famous. This is number six out of the seven. And I hope this morning you'll be edified to hear what Jesus said about himself being the I am, the way, the truth, and the life. So if you would please turn in your Bibles to John, the 14th chapter. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 6 here this morning, really honing in on verse 6. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Jesus is saying to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions, if it were not so. Now, it's better rendered rooms or dwellings. I got the New King James, and that's a poor rendition, so let let me change that. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know the way. We do not know where you're going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let's pray. Perhaps no weightier words have ever been spoken out of the mouth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. These words cut out every other philosophy, every other religion, every other way of looking at reality, every other methodology, every other ism is cut out in this one text alone. Father, help us even this morning to not only appreciate the truth set forth here, but to feel the weight of it. Help me see the beauty of the truth contained herein and to feel the weight of it. O oh, Holy Spirit, please come this morning and be with us. We come with open hearts, mouths that want to be filled with your truth. Some have come in this morning wondering why they're even here. And so, Father, to the first group, I pray that you would bless them and keep them and you would nourish them and that you would give them a deeper understanding of their Savior to the other group, Father, that you might save them and drive them to the one who said he was the way, the truth, and the life, for they have no other hope but in him. Thank you again, Father, for this time we can spend in thy holy word, and we ask you to bless it now to our souls, in Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is walking for the last time on the dusty roads of Palestine. He's going to die. 
And he's continually telling his disciples that he's going away. They don't understand a word he's saying. They think perhaps that he's going away to establish some kind of earthly kingdom. And that's why Peter in chapter 13, verse 36, wants to know, how can we follow you? Where are you going? I want to be with you. Jesus talking to his disciples in this, what we call the upper room discourse, is like two architects that are trying to design a building. One using the normal imperial American system of numbers and the other one using the metric system. No communication. It's not a building I'd want to be in. They don't understand a word Jesus is saying. They haven't yet received the Spirit of God 50 days hence. And so when he's speaking, they're interpreting it a whole different way than what he means. And that is certainly true in the text before us here this morning. Jesus begins in answering Peter's question in verse 36 of chapter 13 by letting them know a little bit about what he's going away to do. And that we find in verses 1 through 4 in the 14th chapter. So I'm giving you a little bit of a lay of the land before we get into verse 6. In those verses, Jesus is using the imagery of a husband going away to establish a home for his betrothed. He says, I'm going away to get things ready for you as a husband would when he had betrothed a woman. In those days, men and women betrothed, which was a covenant arrangement, and then the man would go away and he would establish his residence, sometimes many miles away, sometimes being gone for up to a year. And then on a sudden, he would come back when nobody expected, and he would reclaim his bride. He'd take his bride in, consummate the marriage, and it would have a long wedding feast for about a week. And we see Jesus talking about this kind of thing in several of his parables. For example, the ten virgins, where the bridegroom is coming, and he surprises the five that are unprepared, and so on. That's the husband coming back to consummate the marriage and to have a great feast, a marriage feast. And of course, the disciples hear all that Jesus is saying, but they don't really understand the import of all of it. And so following that comes three questions from three different disciples that show us, demonstrate to us that they are really confused about what Jesus is about to do. The first of those is obviously the subject of our text this morning. Thomas, the doubting one, says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And we'll look at that just momentarily. The second question comes from Philip. And Philip sort of lowers the bar a little bit. Having heard Jesus' answer to Thomas, he says, okay, if, if, we, if you can't take us to the Father, at least show us the Father. Now, that's kind of a, a lesser request. We can't get there, that's fine, but at least show us who the Father is. And Jesus then answers that question in verses 9 through 21. And he says a lot of different things about what he's going to do and so on, and we're not going to get into all that this morning for lack of time. And then in verse 22, we have a third question coming from Judas, not the bad Judas, but the good Judas. And he asked the Lord, uh, Lord, how is it that you're going to manifest or show yourselves to us, the disciples, but not show yourself to the world? They're perplexed. They have no idea what Jesus is doing and what this going away is all about. I right imagine that if we had been there on those dusty roads in Palestine in that year of 30 to 33 AD, we would have been asking the same quizzical questions. Now this morning we want to look at the answer to the 
first of those questions when Thomas asked him in verse 5, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Now, we ask that question in response to what Jesus said in verse 4. And I want you to look at your Bibles and see that Jesus says, and where I go you know, and the way you know. Now, certainly, as I just suggested, Thomas is not thinking in any other terms but physically. He's thinking that Jesus is going to map out a route for them that they can follow him, a physical roadway. Well, Jesus obviously knows this, and he's going to answer Thomas, not in a physical way, but in a spiritual way. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Now, what's interesting about this is that if Jesus had just said, I am the way, no man comes to the Father but through me, that word way would have been subject to some interpretation. For example, when I say, I know the way from here to go home. You can say, yeah, but there probably are five or six different routes you can take to get home. And I would say you're absolutely right. So if Jesus had just talked about the way, that he is the way, perhaps the apostles would have been thinking, well, he's kind of the end goal, but there are a lot of different routes to get there. We use that word way in that way often. There's another way we use the word way, which is why Jesus is going to expand on that very word. For example, you can have a plumber that has an apprentice, and they're fixing a pipe. Now, I know nothing about plumbing, but I know they fix pipes. And the the master might say to the apprentice, um, this is the right way to fix this pipe. Now, what he means by that is not that that necessarily is the only way, but it's the best way. It's the most economical way. It's the fastest and most efficient way. Now, if Jesus was just saying, I am the way, then people might possibly construe from that that Jesus is kind of the most efficient route to the Father. He's the best route among many, and you ought to choose the best route, but after all, if you don't choose the best route, at least you get the second best or the third best or the fourth best route. Because you can fix a pipe, I think, in more than one way. Is that what Jesus is saying? Well, to prove that that's not what he means... Let's look at the text carefully. Jesus answers using the same word way, he's picking up on the word way, and he says, I am the way. And then he expands it and says, I am the truth and the life. Now, what does he mean by that? What role does truth and life have in relationship to the word way? It's what we call explanatory. He's using the words truth and life to explain what does he mean by I am the way. Y'all see that? It's important you see that because that opens up the entire text. We have this going on all the time in the Bible. For example, let me give you another good example where uh, the Apostle Paul, in this case, uses some words to explain a word that might tend to be a little bit obtuse or or fuzzy or prone to misunderstanding. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30, uh, the Apostle Paul is talking about Jesus being the wisdom of God. And you want to say to yourself, what does it mean by Jesus is the wisdom of God? Is he God's guru? What does that mean? And so in chapter 1, verse 30 of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says this, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us the wisdom from God. And if you stop right there, he says, well, he just just used the same word, wisdom, 
You haven't really explained what you mean by he's the wisdom of God. Then he goes on. Dash, which isn't in the Greek, but it's there. Dash and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. In other words, Paul's saying, in this way is Jesus the wisdom of God. He's God's righteousness that he gives to us. He's the sanctification of God in our lives. And he is the redemption price of our salvation. In that way is Jesus the wisdom of God. Not just in any way, just like not in any way is he the way. He's the way in a specific way, which is the truth and the life. So let's go back to our text. I am the way, that is to say, the truth and the life. That's how you read it. So the rest of the sermon is very simple. We're going to find find out or try to figure out what does Jesus mean by he's the truth and he's the life. And thanks be to God, he gives us a specific answer for both of those And they are both found in the book of John itself. Well, how I love the book of John. With young disciples going through John. What a wonderful book. You don't need, you know, you know, you don't need any other book of the Bible but that one. I mean, you do need the other 65, I get that. But I mean, you can you can study John just by reading John. Because he defines everything that he says within his own book. And he does that here. So therefore, what does it mean that Jesus is the truth? Well, first of all, let's say this. That the world is anything but truth. The world is a place that's filled since the fall of lies and deceit, misinformation, confusion, and ignorance. So we're certainly not going to find any truth here. I know what your objection is. Oh, but there is some things that are true in this world. That is true. True is in the sense of if I had a hundred miles square junkyard of old cars that have been sitting there for dozens of years, rusting out. I would say in general, there's nothing here that's worth anything. But I'm sure I could find a mechanic here that could leaf through all of those cars and find parts here and there that were still operable and could still be used. Yes, there is truth in this world. But we don't always know how to find it. We have no roadmap to know exactly what is truth and to be able to stand on it with the conviction that we stand on this. Yeah, some of the philosophers got it right. Maybe even Mohammed got a few things right. But the point is, in this world, there is nothing that is absolutely true that we can rest upon. You cannot rest your soul upon anything this side of heaven. So what does Jesus mean that he is the truth? Well, in order to discover that, we have to, as I suggested, go back into the book of John. And uh, John says basically two things about Jesus being the truth. General broad categories. Number one, what John is going to teach us is that Jesus is the truth because he came from a place that was not on the earth. He's not from here. Nobody in this room can initiate truth. No religion other than Christianity can be true because they all start here. But Jesus did not. Jesus didn't start here. He started in heaven. And heaven is the place where there is absolute truth. Why? Because God is there and God is a God of absolute truth. 
Therefore, the only truth that can actually be is a truth that starts in heaven. Turn back in your Bibles to John chapter 8, and if you have socks on, this might blow them off, because you're going to begin to see, (laughs) you're going to begin to see that this is what Jesus is all about. I never really noticed this before. I think a few people have talked to me about this, and, 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 and it's just come to such vivid light that Jesus is always trying to indicate that he is the one that came from heaven. Actually, it goes all the way back to uh, chapter 7, verse 16. He's at the feast and so on. I'm just going to read you some verses. I just want you to get the feel of this. You don't have to follow along. You can if you want. Listen to these. John chapter 7, verse 16. My doctrine is not mine, but of him who sent me. Chapter 7, verse 28, you both know me and you know where I am from. And I have not come from myself, but he who sent me is true, God the Father, whom you do not know. I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me, 729. This causes the authorities to say in chapter 7, verse 46, by the way, No man ever spoke like this man. Well, that's an intelligent statement. Of course not. He's from heaven. They're from earth. How would they understand a word that he's saying? They don't. You get to chapter 8, Jesus just continues this assault. He says in chapter 8 and beginning in, in verse 14, "'Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true.'" for I know where I came from. You see that? I know where I've come from, and my witness, because I'm from heaven, is absolutely true. For I know where I came from, and I know where I'm going, but you do not know where I come from, because you're not from here, or from heaven, rather, and I, uh, and where I am going. Then he goes on in verse 18, he says, but I have also have one other testimony beside my own, if you need to. I am the one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. There. I'm the witness, the Father is the witness, case closed. I'm from heaven, I have the truth. You don't. Look at verse 23 of chapter 8. You are from beneath, I am from above. You ever thought about that? You're a Christian. Your religion didn't come from you. It didn't come from anybody standing here. It didn't come from any ism, no philosophy. It didn't come from any friend. It didn't come from your own intuition. It didn't come from your own searchings. It came from heaven. Therefore, it's absolutely true. Because Kevin... Heaven cannot be false. It's not from this world. So the first thing that we need to establish why Jesus is the truth is because he didn't come from the place of falsehood. Here, he came from heaven. Y'all see that? He came from heaven. He can't be false if he came from heaven. But then he lays the coup de grace. Not only was I sent from heaven, because guess what? God could have conceivably sent an angel from heaven. Angels aren't from the earth, they're from heaven. And he could have sent an angel from heaven to deliver the message that we needed to hear about truth. Would that have been enough? No. Why? Why? Because we're of the lie. If we're of the lie, then somebody coming just telling us the truth, because we have the lie in us, aren't going to believe the truth. It'll do us no good whatsoever. Talking to a guy yesterday at the campus, three of the young men were with me. This guy's a doctor, he's getting a PhD in geology, he's a Chinese kid. Love him to death, trying to, we're trying to Establish bridges with him and so on. That's brilliant. It's going to 
move and shake the world in China in geology. He forgot more about rocks than I'll ever know. But we're sitting there at lunch and we're trying to give him the gospel and there's just nothing. Just, he doesn't understand a thing we're saying and he's going back to talk about some of the great philosophers that he studied. And, and I'm just sitting there going, here's a man with a genius of a mind and he doesn't understand one single word from the Bible. Now, God had to do more than just send an angel. And that's why Jesus then will say in three different ways in chapter 8 that not only did God, did he come from heaven to give us truth, but that he came from heaven, listen to this, as the God of truth. Now, that's a whole different animal. Listen to verse 24. Therefore I said to you, talking still to the Jews, that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that, there is our phrase again, I am, you will die in your sins. Verse 28, then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And then the text that Pastor George spoke about several weeks ago, verse 58, Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Three times. He says he's God. How do we know that? How do, they, how do we know they even understood that? Because verse 59, they picked up stones to stone him. Now, if Jesus was just saying, I'm just a messenger from God, they wouldn't have stoned him for that. A lot of messengers from God. But when you say, I'm a messenger from God, and I am God, the messenger, that is something altogether different. When Jesus says he is the truth, he means that he is the absolute express image. He is the incarnation. He is the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form coming down from heaven to give us truth. And he came in the form of a man. Not to just tell us about truth, but to put truth within us. You see, truth is perceiving what is according to what it really is in reality. And only Jesus can give us that kind of truth. Think with me for a minute of a group of miners, say 50 miners, trapped 5,000 feet below the surface via an explosion. They're starving. Oxygen is running low. They're about to die. Hope has diminished to nothing. Down below, they have some manuals about how you can... Uh, get out of a, a mine, but this mine all is sealed shut. There's no hope there. Up on the surface is a group of experts, and they're all getting all the manuals together. So this is how we normally can get people out of the mine, and they're shouting down to the guys that are 5,000 5, feet down, hey, we've got the manuals how we can get you out of this mine, but we don't know how to get down there. We know all about how much oxygen you got left, how much food is going to sustain you, and all this and that and the other thing. The men are still down in the mine perishing. You got to think with me. I'm straining at the illustration. But assume the guy that made mines, that know all about mines, comes 
to this, the other men, these experts, and he says, listen, not only do I know all about minds, but when I touch somebody, they are filled with oxygen. And when I touch someone, they are filled with food. And I'm also powerful enough to take anybody out of this mind that's down there. And somehow they get this guy down into the belly of the earth to these 50 perishing men. And immediately, he knows the way out. They touch him. Oxygen pours into their lungs. They touch him. Food pours into their stomach. They touch him and hope fills their spirit. Better than that, he puts the 50 men on his back and takes them out of the mine. Now that's salvation. That's what Jesus means by he is the truth. He was sent from heaven and he was sent as the only one who could actually bring us out of our estate of ignorance and lies. I am the truth. Do you believe in him? Not as a guru. Not as the one that shows you a better way to live. Not as the one that maps out the road to success. Not as the one that makes you happy when you're sad or rich when you're poor or fixes your relationships, or does all these other things, the one that actually gives you life because he was sent from God and he is God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. What does he mean by the life? Well, it's the same idea here. Pretty simple for a simple guy. He will explain earlier in John that he's the life for two reasons. Because he, you can repeat after me, because he came from God and he was God. And he bore the life of God in him. Go back to chapter 6. We all know about chapter 6. We've preached one of the uh, the great I am's out of this, I am the bread of life, and so on. But I want you to notice again, now as Jesus is laboring with this crowd, he is laboring to show them that he is the very life of God. I want you to notice how often, once again, he says that he came down. Look at verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He that believes in me shall never thirst. Skip down to verse 38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him who sent me. Verse 41, the Jews are complaining. I am the bread which came down from heaven. Verse 42, they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? How could he have come down from heaven? And he says, I have come down from heaven. Verse 45, it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father, because I've been with the Father, comes to me. Verse 50, this is the bread which comes down from heaven. Verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Why is Jesus the only life? Because he came from the place where life itself dwells. This is a world of death, beloved. Do you not know that? Is there anything here that lives forever and prospers and does exactly what it's supposed to do? No. You want life? It's not going to come from here. It must come from heaven. That's salvation. 
So God is going to send down the messenger of life. Oh, no, no. Much better than that. He sends down life himself. And for that, go back to uh, chapter 5, the preceding chapter, if you want, or I'll just read it. Here's Jesus again talking, and I want you to listen to his words. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear it will live. Now listen to this in verse 26. For as the Father has life in himself, that's the very definition of God. He's a God of life. Everything outside of God has no life. God alone has life. You say, what is life? Is it biological life? Well, that's nothing. Is it like the good life? You know, people say, I want to live. I want to get this new car and really live it up. I want to, remember the old the beer commercials, Miller High Life? I, I'm dating myself now. A glass of beer is going to give me life. That's not life. Listen to what is life. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son, what? To have life in himself. Think about this. You want life. There's one place to find it. It's not here. It's there. Wherever heaven is. I'm pointing up there. Maybe it's there. I don't know. Maybe it's down. I don't know where heaven is. It's over there. <laughs> but better than that. Life itself came down. I'm in the hospital. I'm dying. I have no, no kidney function whatsoever. Zero. I'm going to die any day. Friend number one walks in. Hey, Rick, good to see you, buddy. Let me tell you all about how to take care of your kidneys. Did I say liver? I meant to say kidneys. Either one works. Let me tell you how to take care of your kidneys. Eat this and that. Drink a lot of water. Do this kind of exercise routine, and you'll spare your kidneys. I say to friend number one, thanks a lot. That's too late. Friend number two walks in. He's got the manuals. He studied everything there is to know about kidneys. And he says, I know everything about kidneys, about operations on kidneys, about kidney transplants, the capacity of kidneys. You only need one kidney. I know. Ask me anything about kidneys, I know. He said, I'll tell you anything you need to know about kidneys. He said, thanks. That doesn't help me. Friend number three walks in. Friend number three says, hey, look, it, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a billionaire. Whatever it takes, I'll pay for the kidney transplant. Every operation you need, it's yours. Don't worry about a thing about the money. Hey, thanks. I'm going to die. Friend number four walks in. I love you. I love you, Rick. I got two kidneys. I'll give you one. What friend do you want? One, two, or three? Four. I want four. That's what Jesus did. He didn't tell us how to live. He didn't give us the manual. He gave us himself. So we could live. If you're a Christian today, you are a Christian because the life of Jesus Christ has been implanted in you. You didn't find it for yourself. You don't live on your own by reading books because Jesus gave you life. Jesus is answering his disciples. Someday they're going to get it. I pray this morning because if you have the Spirit of God, you've already gotten it. I am the way, the truth, 
and the life. And because only the one from heaven can give you truth, and only the one from heaven can give you life, there's no other option. None. Folks, you only have one way of knowing truth and knowing life, and it's through Jesus Christ. And not as your guru. And not simply as your rabbi. And not simply as the one that shows you the manuals. Not the one that shows you how to live. Remember the book in 1896, published by Charles Shelton. It was a bestseller in its day. It was called In His Steps. Anybody ever hear of that book? Somebody gave it to me after, right after I was saved. I didn't know any better, so I, I read the book. But this is a story about rural America, rural America kind of like where Barry's from. And rural America, and, and, and uh, all the Christians get together one day and says, we're going to do exactly what Jesus will do in every situation. And it spawned the WWJD movement. What would Jesus do? Is that salvation? Doing what Jesus would do? I could do what Jesus did in every possible way that I can think of, and I'm still going to go to hell. Because I'm still dead. And I'm still without truth. You need... Jesus Christ. And how do you get it? By partaking of Him by faith and faith alone. Stop trying to be true. Stop trying to be alive without Jesus. Stop! Some of you here this morning are still trying to do that. Some of you kids this morning, college group, older people are still trying to do that. I've got this Christian life all figured out. I got the boxes checked. I go to church. I know who Jesus is, what he did. I can recite the parables backwards and forwards. Do you have his life in you? Do you have his truth in you? Please. Uh, Robert read uh, Hebrews 9. I was struck by this um, when I was studying for this text. And that's a great text. It talks about Jesus being the only way, and they went into the holy place once per year, the high priest alone. You know all about that. But I want you to notice there were three things that were in the holy place. It's right here in the text, if I could find it. Yeah, verse 4. In the ark, which is the representation of the presence of God, had the golden censer, the ark of the covenant, the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded. I want you to think about this a second. What was in the ark? The ark is the very presence of God. It is where God dwelled. There are three things, at least, there might be four, but the three I want to highlight here that are in the ark. I want you to think about this. What are the three things that are closest to God? Number one, the law. Remember the tablets were put in the ark? The Law of God, the truth of God, put in the ark. God is truth. 
Number two, you have the rod that budded. Remember that story in Numbers? Everybody's rod was taken out and only the rod of Levi budded because showing that he was the true and only high priest. Life. One rod buds, the rest of them are dead sticks. And then, the golden pot that had manna. Where does the truth and where does the life come from? Down from heaven. When Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, he is saying that he is the only one that's ever come from heaven and brought us truth and life. And therefore, that is the only way to God. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Yes, John. Do you believe that? It's the only way to God. begging you this morning if you don't know Jesus Christ you have some kind of association with Jesus some knowledge of Jesus some kind of good works for Jesus following Jesus you're a good moral guy good moral kid your parents are whatever do you know him as the truth and the life. That's the only way. W-A-Y. That you can go to the Father. Would you please today. I'll stay here all afternoon. I'll let Logan preach at the nursing home. I'll stay here all afternoon. If you want to know how to be saved. Don't be embarrassed. If you say, I don't know what the heck he's talking about. Please, there'll be elders up here. Please talk to somebody. Would you please talk to somebody about how you can know Jesus Christ? There are many here that know him that way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Father, thank you. It's such a simple text. Don't let it be obscured of people today. Help them to see it, to believe it, to grasp it. You're there willing. You're willing to give them truth, the truth of God. You're willing to give them life, the very life of God. All they need do is come. Nothing in their hands they bring. Simply to the cross they cling. Oh God, comfort those today that know you and draw those today that do not. I ask this in Jesus' name, our precious way, truth, and life. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.